Merrick, welcome to the show. Welcome, Sean. Thank you for the invite. Yeah, thanks so much for being here. I feel like we got a ton to cover, so let's uh, maybe let's get the intros in the way. Who are you and what do you do? Uh, it. So um, I'm Eric, one of the software engineers at Pinecone. I mostly work on the core database team. Um, and so maybe like a bit of a story. So when I was like 14, I started coding uh, mostly websites. So that was like primary school. Um, and then in like high school, uh, worked on worked on websites, worked on like full stack software development. Um, after which I got into Shopify. So first like as an intern and then transitioned uh, to doing more of a data science work and, and machine learning on their risk algorithms. Uh, that sort of uh, switch from being like a developer into more of a data scientist uh, made me realize like I actually want to like do this uh, more seriously. And so I went back to the university and did some research in AI, uh, machine learning, mostly like adversarial machine learning and sort of like figuring out how to make uh, machine learning models robust against like adversarial attacks. Um, and yeah, like uh, after after COVID started, actually, I, I started thinking about... Um, Vector databases and sort of like use this for, for vector search, uh, which um, took me to like start uh, a vector database, like open source vector database as a sort of side project. Um, after which like Pancom reached out to me and sort of like I joined the company. Uh, yeah, now we're good. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that was, uh, you know, sort of fortuitous timing for you to go back to school and, and spend some time like learning how to do, uh, you know, make AI models, you know, more robust yeah. given essentially like this huge trend that we're seeing in the industry, because now I think people are desperate to find anybody that has like real sort of ML engineering chops. Uh, and there's, you know, plenty of opportunities that's to, out there for folks like yourself. Yeah, definitely. Like that was unplanned, but very fortunate for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, sometimes the best things are, are sort of unplanned. All right. So I want to talk vectors. Uh, you know, I feel like until sure. recently, most people sort of barely knew what a vector was, let alone vector search and vector databases. And I right. think maybe maybe if you did some university level, you know, linear algebra, geometry and things like that, you've come across vectors at some point and maybe kind of vaguely will remember what they are. But with the explosion and interest in AI, it's really brought all of this stuff, I think, to the forefront. Vectors are sort of in yep. this peep hike cycle right now. And uh, it's like they got this, like, you know, new PR agency in charge of uh, vectors or something. That they're just like, <laughs> yeah. you know, riding this wave, essentially, that's going on. But I think a good place to start things off is just with some basics of, you know, what is a vector? And then what are vector embeddings? And why are they needed for AI? Sure. Um, so, I mean, like, if I were to be very theoretical from, like, university point of view, most people learn about vectors as, like, being a, a tuple of numbers, right, or a list of uh, numbers. And, like, from physics, you would know, like, the force vectors, you have, like, points in space, which are like, essentially vectors. Um, but, like, for the purposes of AI, vectors really represent, uh, so, like, a compressed representation of, of an object, right? So you can have, like, a token in LLM. That's, like, a word. And you have a representation of that token, which is a vector, uh, essentially some point in a high dimensional space. Similarly for images, you can uh, imagine like vector being a compressed representation of an image. So really um, you sort of build these like lists of numbers that represent some meaning of the object uh, that they like correspond to. Um, I think that would be like a best representation for people who don't really have a background in like machine learning. It's sort of to think about vectors as being just a compressed representations of, of some objects. Yeah, so like uh, the other important part about vectors is that uh, they carry semantic meaning, right? So if you have an image of uh, a dog and a car and another dog, like the two images of the dogs will be closer to each other than the image of a dog and the image of a car. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my understanding of essentially the, the value of, you know, essentially uh, uh, converting things, objects into vectors, into these points in space is it essentially two points that are close to each other or some other measurement of similarity between the vectors says something yep. about the semantic similarity of those particular objects. If you exactly. do essentially the exactly. encoding of the embedding correctly. Yeah. So um, how is that actually, you know, what is that process to create these embeddings or these vectorized versions of objects? You know, how do we essentially take something like text and convert it into a numerical representation? What are some of the algorithms or approaches that are used to do that? Right, so maybe I can give an example for text where, like the, in the most basic case, like if you try, train an LLM, is that you, you take a piece of text, this is just like downloaded from the internet, some, some corpus of the text, 
and then train the LLM to sort of predict the next token in the text, right? It, it considers some context uh, in, in the past. And given, given the context, it predicts the, the next word. So that's sort of like the, this, this training process uh, turns out produces uh, vector representations that are in some sense meaningful, right? That they carry some semantic uh, meaning for the, for the token that they represent. Um, for, for maybe specifically for like question answering, what people didn't do, they take a pre-trained model, which was sort of like training with this next word prediction uh, training objective. And they sort of try to optimize this so that uh, very explicitly answers to specific questions are closer to each other than answers to unrelated questions, right? So you sort of have this contrasted loss where you take a triplet of maybe like an answer or, uh, or maybe a question or a relevant answer and uh, an answer that's not relevant. And then they try to minimize the distance between the question and the relevant answer and maximize the, the vector distance between the question and the non-relevant answer. So that's sort of like this, this uh, sort of triplet loss objective can be used uh, both for like uh, text and also images, right? You can, you can take uh, like known uh, closed images or similar images and these similar images and just optimize this objective. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about actually optimizing that objective? Like making sure that the, essentially the resulting vectors, those points in space that are close to each other are actually semantically similar for whatever sort of problem that you're trying to address. Yeah, so that, this is like the process that I described you. You sort of have a data set of, maybe you pre-trained, let's say you pre-trained the, the LLM on a large unstructured uh, like uh, corpus of text. Mm -hmm. And then you have a smaller data set of questions and answers that you know are relevant, right? So at each training step, you sort of sample a uh, question answer and maybe an answer that's not relevant. And then you usually like embed the question, the answer and the non-relevant answer. And you try to minimize the distance uh, between the, the relevant pair and maximize the distance or a training objective for the non-relevant part. Um, that's like this minimization maximization, of course, depends on what sort of uh, distance function you use, but uh, mm -hmm. that's generally the idea. Okay, okay, I, I see. So essentially you're, once you've done the training, you're taking the, you're using this as further sort of testing to kind of like, you know, fine tune the model or, or tweak the parameters yep. so that you're getting essentially uh, some sort of like similarity score, or dissimilarity score that's going to make sense for whatever yep. problem that you're trying to solve. So in terms of vector search, like what is vector search and then how is that different than other, you know, search technologies or search approaches that we might be familiar with, like bag of words or keyword based search? Yeah, so I would say that vector search is uh, different from those in, in a sense that it's soft, right? Uh, in, in keyword retrieval, you have very, like you only search for items that contain a specific keyword. Like of course there's some like, um, you, you normalize the tokens or do you, you remove some very common words, but it, it, deep down, like it, you only retrieve uh, documents that hardly like contain very specific keywords. Uh, in vector search, that's different because uh, you sort of, the, the vectors themselves, as, as we talked about, contain uh, semantic meaning, right? So your retrieval is sort of soft um, in that sense, not hard. So by soft, you mean it's, it's sort of like a, a fuzzy similarity versus yeah. necessarily like an exact match of similarity. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then what are some of the unique challenges when it comes to vector searches? Is it essentially just the, the sheer size of the vectors? Like where, where are some of the problems or hard problems to solve? I mean, sheer size would definitely be the, the first one I would talk about because uh, I just did like quick, quick map before. And so consider like a data set of billion items, right? If you, if you have a bunch of uh, columns that are scalar values, so like just floats and like literally scalar values, that data set would be on the order of like hundreds of gigabytes. Whereas like for the same data set of billion items and vectors that are produced maybe by like ADA2 or some, some very common embedding model, that data set would be like single digit terabytes or more. And so just literally like representing the, the data for like same, same number of items, but vector data is just order of magnitude uh, bigger bigger mm -hmm. in that sense. Um, the, the other thing maybe to talk about here is that um, like in academic research, you have uh, papers talking about like building vector search indices for, for static data, right? So you, you are given a data set up front, you are free to pre-compute whatever you want. And then sort of the, the goal for the papers mostly is to like build uh, either the smallest index or the, or the fastest index for, for the data set. And this is, this is like the benchmark they, they use to sort of publish paper and, and compare different algorithms between each other. Um, so what we found is that this is not really where like the most of the real world use cases are. So like in, in real world, you, of course you care about speed, you, you care about performance, but um, on the other hand, what you also care about is like cost effectiveness and like scaling, scaling very easily. Also, 
in, in like compared to vector search in a vector database, you want to be able to update the items on the fly. So you, you want to be like able to modify the items, insert new data, and that data to be like available to you pretty much as soon as you write it to the database. And that's that's sort of like very very unique and sort of hard to achieve um, in like a very cost efficient manner. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Also, maybe uh, another point here is that um, so far as we talked about like vector search being uh, sort of soft or fuzzy, mm -hmm. and standard search techniques being hard, uh, vector databases are really the first instance of a database that's approximate, right? In, in, in like a SQL database, you want to get an exact answer for the query, and you're well, okay, there's eventual consistency and so on, but like in most cases, you care about an exact answer. In vector databases, like you're because the the data is so big and uh, it's very computationally intensive, uh, the the database itself is an approximate. So it's you're not giving like exact answers uh, because that just would be infeasible over over the larger number of items. Mm -hmm. In terms of handling the size of how big these data sets that can grow in terms of representing the vectors, are there different essentially compression techniques used to, rather than, you know, using a full floating point number, we can use essentially like a reduced size representation of the number or other ways of essentially compressing the data? Yes, uh, for sure. Like in, in academic papers, uh, this is sort of mostly done with pre-computing, which is what I said about like having st static data sets and pre-computing your representations. Then you can like use less memory. You can, you can be faster because you can quantize vectors more. Uh, and the challenge really here is to, to be able to do that quantization and do that compression of vectors on the fly without like being able to handle fresh data as it comes and being able to do that compression. Mm -hmm. Actually, and then in classical databases, there's you know lots of different ways of indexing information, you know, like B trees, hash indexes, tries, depending on like what problem you're trying to solve. How yeah. is a vector index created? Like what algorithms are you typically used for indexing and then how are those sort of different than maybe conventional database indexing? Um, yeah, so I can maybe describe a uh, graph algorithm here because that's uh, something that's very popular in like open source community. Um, and so in like a starter database, say you build a B tree, right? You, you insert items, you, sp you split pages and you sort of uh, shuffle that on disk. Uh, in vector databases, what you're trying to do is uh, when you have a data set, you sort of are trying to use the index to very quickly find the region of the space that contains all the items, right? And so in graph, uh, what that would mean is that when you when you enter the graph, you you hit some entry node, and then you are sort of trying to traverse the graph into the interesting region of the space, right? So uh, you're sort of trying to take very long range connections, and like the distance between the neighboring items is very very large, uh, to sort of quickly skip over the the boring stuff, and then once you find the interesting stuff, you sort of try to get the the sort of close neighbors uh, or near neighbors for that vector. And sort of explore that that uh, part more. And like for example, uh, if I were to take HNSW, that's exactly what it does, right? The the higher levels are essentially very sparse skip list that skip over the, the boring stuff. And then once you go to lower levels, you actually start having like more dense neighborhoods for the for the vertices. Mm -hmm. And then you start sort of exploring more to like improve your recall. Um, yeah, that would that would generally be the idea. Yeah. So is the indexing. So essentially, if I wanted to, uh, you know, full find, you know, what collection of vectors are similar to my input, I'm starting at, you know, a particular node, and then I'm doing essentially casting out maybe like a in a breadth first search or breadth first manner out to the other yep. nodes, and then going walking essentially the graph to where the most similar items are, and then based on whatever my similarity score is, and then finding essentially this compact region that represents the most relevant information or most similar vectors. Yes, um, so they go like a binary tree, right? You, you only consider nodes that are in the range that you're looking for, and it's like one dimensional. So that's generally, this is the same idea, but instead of having like scalars or one dimensional vectors, uh, you have like 512 for 1,000 dimensions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So very, very, uh, lots of other performance challenges and scale problems that you're going to run into. So where yeah. does essentially like a vector database come into place like with this? So the do we need essentially a new type of database to support vector indices and vector search queries? Like some of the, you know, machine learning work that I've done in the past. Now I'm not dealing with like massive scale. So I've been able to represent those using sort of conventional databases. So at what point do you sort of need to introduce something like a vector database and what value is it giving you? 
Um, I, I'll try to motivate this answer uh, from from a different point of view. So, mm-hmm. um, in like uh, LLM workloads, uh, LLMs is like people started training them and sort of making bigger and bigger LLMs. Uh, what it turned out to happen is that the LLMs have an emergent abilities, right? So they, they're able to do tasks that are weren't explicitly trained on. And this is sort of like in, to, in context learning where you, you can give an LLM and a few examples of what it's supposed to do. And then it's sort of able to imitate that behavior going forward. Um, and this is sort of like not explicitly optimized. This is sort of something that emerges just from the sheer scale of the LLM and the, like the amount of data that is seen during training. Um, where vector databases specifically come into play uh, here is that you can use this, this ability to adapt its behavior or sort of bias the behavior of LLM by giving it some context that's relevant for whatever the user typed in or like the user provided. Um, and this is this is like the general uh, idea of retrieval augmented generation where you sort of have some some interactions with the LLM. Uh, you you query the, the vector database, get some relevant context, and this is sort of like uh, context that's uh, useful that the LLM can use to sort of bias its answers and be more 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 helpful uh, or hallucinate less, and then um, yeah, sort of provide that context to the LLM uh, to generate better answers. Mm-hmm. So I mean, outside of this, like essentially using a vector database to provide better context in the application of using like an LLM, are there other applications where you might use a vector database? Uh, yeah, for sure. So the the other maybe like uh, obvious use case here would be image search, right? Uh, you you can represent images by by vectors, as we talked about, like semantically similar vectors, and then you can index your your corpus of images in the vector database and and sort of like search, sort of like do reverse image search uh, u- using vectors. Other other very popular use cases use case for uh, vector databases is recommender systems. So you can you can have a vector that represents your user your user interests. And then you have some vectors representing either like your movies, your products, your uh, essentially your your content. And then you can use the similarity between user interests and and vectors representing items to sort of recommend the most relevant items for the user. So that's that's an excuse mm-hmm. case. That's it's pretty popular. Mm-hmm. Okay, I see. And then you know we've talked a little bit about sort of the how like vector search and vector database. You're, you're really getting sort of like a soft set of results that are. We think that these things are similar, but they're not necessarily like a you know exactly the, uh, an exact match, and that's kind of the value that you're getting is you can essentially create uh, or look at these uh, things that are you know objects that are similar in the same way that like a person might determine that two things are similar. Yep. But what is the trade off in terms of the way that you measure similarity? Like, there's a trade off I would imagine in terms of accuracy and speed. Like, is there? And it's also in terms of the way that you actually measure the similarity between vectors, there's different ways of that. You can look at you know the angle between the vectors. You can look at the distance between the points and so forth. So, yep. like, how do you actually choose the right similarity measurement and balance that between essentially the accuracy and the speed that you're looking for? Uh, right. So, like, for the purposes of vector database, you sort of want to use uh, the metric that the model has been trained on, right? So, if the if your embedding model uses a cosine similarity metric you should use that for your vector index because then you're going to get the best results. Like the the organization of vector in the space sort of makes sense in that metric. So you, you want to use the same metric. You can essentially spend more memory uh, or sp- spend more resources and build uh, a better index, right? Or, or an index that uh, gives you higher recall um, uh, at the cost of, usually the cost for that is uh, one higher memory usage. And uh, second, your QPS or the number of requests you can you can serve or searches per second goes down because you're spending more compute resources per query to actually satisfy that and provide a better recall. Uh, this is uh, what we found. This is very uh, there's a pretty strong law of diminishing returns where for any one percentage point you you gain in in your recall, your QPS might drop by uh, like an order of magnitude, right? So there, there is a point at which uh, it doesn't make sense to push recall further. Of, of course you can do it. Like the, the most extreme case is the exact search. So literally scan all the items, uh, but that's that's super slow. So the, the, there is like a continuum of sort of choosing the best, uh, the best recall and best QPS and, and at the same time, like minimizing the number of resources or the amount of resources you use to actually serve that uh, index. 
How do people kind of uh, typically go about like testing what the right sort of like parameters and limits that they're going to use for their particular application to know that it's, you know, basically like good enough to satisfy whatever their requirements are? Yeah. In general, like from a, from a bank room point of view, we actually want to provide you a vector database where you don't have to tune your hyperparameters. So you, you don't want to care about, as, as a developer, you don't want to care about changing the hyperparameters of some algorithm that like you may need to read five research papers to actually understand how to tune that properly. So <laughs> we, we as a company take that responsibility on us and try to like set a very reasonable defaults uh, that work in most cases. And also like make sure that uh, we are robust to cases that may be adversarial for that index. Um, if, if you were to do that yourself, uh, of course, you can, like, for a reasonably scaled data sets, uh, you can pre-compute a set of exact neighbors and then compare your approximate indexed, uh, index to your set of exact neighbors. This is mm, very hardly feasible for data sets that are, like, billion items and more. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, so a bit, basically you could do something where you look at doing sort of the brute force vector comparison. Exactly. If your data exactly. set is small enough or your test set small enough and then see how that compares to essentially the whatever similarity metrics or index that you're using. Yes. Maybe a good place to, to, to talk is also what other technologies are typically involved in sort of the tool chain that's going to be involved with the, like a vector database. So if we're thinking about, um, you know, something like ETL for warehousing, you know, you have this kind of like whole tool chain of orchestration, your data sources, and there's all kinds of tools that are involved in that. What is the yep. typical tool chain in the world of sort of vector search and vector databases? Yeah, so the the, the other part that sort of you need to, to transfer your object, your, your text, your images into vectors is a, is a model, right? So the, the obvious uh, complementary part for vector database would be some sort of uh, inference engine or, or model inference provider, be that OpenAI, be that uh, Anthropic, be that Cohere, uh, or like open source solutions. Uh, that sort of transforms your your data, your text, your images into vectors. Um, then you, like, you have a vector database part where you load the vectors into a database, you search it, um, you have some front end that maybe like queries that database and then provides the results. And I, I think in general, like these components, uh, fit onto the same like ETL pipeline where you have some ingestion of, of data, then you, then you call the model, uh, convert your data into embeddings, load it into vector index or vector database, and then serve it, right? So um, I think like the, the general, general pattern is the same, just the tools are different. Mm -hmm. I see, okay. You know, looking at sort of the non-vector database world, there are, you know, databases that are designed for to solve specific problems. Like it could be that they, they are really good for like high throughput reads, high volume writes. In the world of like a vector database, like where is sort of the big like load problem? We talked about some of the scale issues with just representing the data. Is that kind of where the main like challenge comes from? Or are there other places that you might need to essentially, um, you know, concentrate a lot of effort in being able to like address specific like like uh, uh, sort of hard to solve problems in in the world of vector databases. Yeah, um, I would say if it's both because um, in, in like a vector database, you are trying to sort of do amortize as such work up front to build the index and to maintain the index, so that queries are very cheap, right? Uh, you you wouldn't need a vector database if you just were to scan all your data. You can just scan uh, all the vectors, and you really wouldn't need any compute. But then your queries would be very computationally heavy. So you sort of shift that transfer, uh, shift that compute from from the query time into some like index building time where you actually pre-compute uh, some stuff from the data, build an index, and then sort of use that index to serve queries more efficiently. And this is, uh, in general, this is the most computationally demanding part of our database. Mm -hmm. I see. And then, in terms of, you know, we talked about one of the applications, and I think one of the really popular applications right now of vector databases of being able to use it to provide some sort of in context to uh, give essentially instru further instructions when we're yep. you know, running a prompt through an LLM. So how do we, there's limits essentially to the amount of data that we can send in a set of instructions to an LLM. So does the data, does the vector database give me some tooling out of the box that helps me like choose essentially the right set or like limit of context that's going to be most valuable for uh, like serving my prompt. 
Yeah. So in, in general, like you are retrieving some some number of most relevant items from a vector database, right? You can you can limit that to fit your context window, and sort of only retrieve the the stuff that helps the model to sort of gain the most knowledge or like make the generation more grounded, in a sense. Um, what people also do is instead of uh, plugging the results from a vector database directly into the output of LLM, they maybe overfetch uh, by a factor of ten. So like you, you need you need ten items, but you really fetch one hundred, right? And then you use some second stage model uh, mm. that actually that's very much more computationally expensive. So from your corpus of I don't know ten billion items, you retrieve the hundred that are most relevant. And then use a much more expensive model to sort of re-rank the, those hundreds into into five or ten, and then you provide that that set of ten into into the model that actually generates uh, the answer to the user. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, so we're using essentially a secondary model, which could be more you know expensive to operate, but it's going to be much smaller because it's really specially designed to essentially let us identify what's the right context to send in in essentially the set of instructions in the prompt. Yeah, you, you can also provide like real time uh, information into that model. So maybe you have a vector database of all the products uh, and then you provide some in session information for the user into that re-ranking model to, to make the answers or make the results more relevant. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, you know, I want to transition a little bit to talk about Pinecone specifically. So, you know, sure. there's lots of, I think, growth and interest in the world of, you know, vector databases we've touched on, but like how does Pinecone essentially compare to some of the other vector databases on the market? Like what is sort of the, the differentiator that you're getting? Uh, yeah, first of all, maybe I would say that uh, we built Pinecone from the ground up to be a vector database. We sort of didn't adapt a uh, vector search uh, engine to be a database. We really built it from the ground up to be as a database. And also, as maybe most listeners know, we, we don't provide an open solution. So Pinecone is fully hosted. We provide it as a, like essentially software as a service. Uh, we manage the infrastructure for you. We manage the index for you. And so we try to be very, very operationally simple. So we try to move the operational burden from, from developers and maybe from like users to, to us and so, sort of give you the API to sort of just interact with the database. Mm -hmm. I see. All right. So essentially it's, it's operating as a managed service. Um, and, uh, and then like we've talked about earlier, essentially you're kind of abstracting away a lot of the complexity of, of figuring yeah. out like, how do I, you know, sort of like tweak the parameters to get the optimal index is kind of just offloaded for me. Yeah. And the other important part is that uh, the database just scales, right? So you can, you can start uh, inserting more data. You don't have to worry about uh, like changing your index, uh, figure out how to scale it. We, we as a database start to scale uh, for you. Mm -hmm. And then, how does or what are some of the like biggest engineering challenges that you've had to overcome during your time at Pinecone? Like, what are some of the hard problems that you're you're trying to solve as a company? I, I guess the the all, the sort of the problem is really the scale, right? So when I joined two years ago, uh, we used to talk about like million scale indexes being as big, uh, and like that went from uh, just just single digit millions. To now regularly talking about like tens of billions and hundreds of billions items in an index, like being sort of something you can like handle pretty pretty easily. Uh, so that's one thing, and the other thing is uh, just the sheer number of customers, right? So not every customer is going to have an index that's hundreds of billions of items, but there are a lot of customers with like million scale indexes, and so sort of being able to uh, just provide a very good service to tens of thousands of customers. Uh, very cheaply has been the other the other challenge. So there's like these two axes where there are customers that are very big, but also just the sheer number of customers grew orders of magnitude more. Yeah. So I guess that, I mean the the growth in customers is probably a high quality problem as, as a company. But <laughs> yeah, um, that's a, that's a good problem to have, but problem or less. So w why do you think that there? You know, was it an underestimate in terms of? like how big these indices would go. Like you're talking just a few years ago of like, you know, in the millions, now you're in the billions. Like, did you, did you not foresee it essentially getting this big or was there some unforeseen event that led to such a like a huge growth and explosion in terms of the size of these indices for certain types of companies or use cases? Uh, I would say we did foresee it, but we maybe didn't expect it to go as fast as it really did. Right. So mm -hmm. there is like, as an, as an engineer, you sort of built a system for a specific purpose or a specific specification. 
And our specification is like uh, interviewed customers and talk to customers has really been like hundreds of, of millions up to a billion. Uh, and that was sort of like we build a system to to scale to that point. And like it's possible to scale that system even further. Uh, and we can handle like the, the system that we build actually handles uh, workloads that are bigger than like what the first first saw it, it being. But at that point, like the cost of that system starts uh, going high, right? right? So once you know that the system uh, is going to handle a uh, much bigger workload, you can design it differently to actually be much more cost efficient uh, for the customers. And that's really what we, what we want to do. We want to provide a very cost efficient way to serve really, really big indices. Mm -hmm. Was there significant like refactoring from the engineering side in order to handle these like larger indices or was the approach essentially sound and you really, it really came down to more of like an infrastructure scaling problem? I would say both. Like you need to change infrastructure and the, and the way you organize the system. Uh, algorithms uh, sort of translate to a degree from, from like smaller approaches to, to bigger approaches. But the way you sort of map that algorithm onto the, like a distributed system, right? It, it's not a single node. So like, in the, like we don't serve the index as a single node. So the way you use the algorithm and sort of map it on a distributed system changes uh, once you go from like hundreds of millions to tens of billions and more. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then what do you see, you know, outside of even some of the challenges that we've talked about specifically with Pinecone, like what are the biggest challenges in vector search today? What are the kind of big gnarly problems that people haven't really solved yet? Yeah, so I think in general, it's going to be cost effectiveness uh, and being able to serve very large indexes with reasonable QPS uh, in a cost-efficient manner, right? You, as you talked about uh, LLMs having in-context in learning abilities and sort of being able to use external context or external memory to sort of ground their generation. And then the grounding can be like your company docs, whatever, your, your product documentation. Um, you want that cost to be smaller than cost of fine tuning LLMs or just serving LLMs, right? That, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's one of the like biggest challenges, uh, mm -hmm. making sure that we just are cost effective. Yeah. I think one of the analogies that I really like that I came across in terms of like understanding sort of how like vector search and vector databases, um, can enhance like, uh, or, or used in the context of LLMs is, and you just mentioned it there, it's like an external memory. It's, it's kind of similar yep. to like, as a human, you might ask me a question and I might be like, oh, I'm not a hundred, you know, I got to look that up and I can use like, you know, Google search or look it up in a, uh, in a library yep. in the old days and, and like use that essentially as my external memory. And we use that all the time to like augment the way that we answer questions or respond to things. And essentially the LLM plus the vector database is the same essentially function that like a human's using those resources for. Yeah. Uh, LLM actually works similarly to human brain, right? It, it sort of attends to interesting parts uh, selectively. So it doesn't like, it has the, like the ability to attend to whatever is the, is the past context, but it selects only the most relevant part. And so if you extend that context uh, by some external knowledge, which is just not present in the LLM, because like you would either have to fine tune it or like retrain the, or fine tune the LLM every day to sort of keep it up to date. If you can provide the dynamic memory externally, the LLM can decide to like then use that memory to sort of provide better, better generations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I think some of the value there is that, you know, generally the foundation models are, you know, they're, they're built at a fixed epoch. So they might be two years at a date in terms of like the latest things that are going on. Yes. So then you can use this in context learning to provide more, you know, up to date information as well as yep. more domain specific information. It could be, you know, using your internal company documents or something like that to help like, you know, exactly. be an additional resource for uh, providing an answer. Yep. What do you see as kind of like the future in the space? Like wh where do vector databases, vector search go from here? I think it's the one like providing, providing good service and sort of providing, being really a database, right? So as, as you, as you write the data to the database, you want to provide fresh results. Uh, at the same time, you don't want to pay the cost. Like every change to the database shouldn't incur the cost of like rebuilding the index from scratch. So you want to like provide uh, fresh results in a like cost efficient manner, and also I think uh, just the developer experience of, of building a, like a generative AI application or an ML application 
can be much simpler than it is today, right? So you want to provide tools to sort of make embeddings of, of text or images very, very easy. You want to have the vector database just be there. Like you don't want to worry about scaling it. You want to, you don't worry about like availability, provisioning the nodes and so on. So uh, that, that part should be uh, very simple. And also like, I think uh, developers should only pay for resources they really use. And you don't want to pay for this idle compute that's sitting there and not doing really any like useful work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess that's like, I mean, I think that's like the secret sauce of a lot of the, the public cloud is sort of the, you know, the, essentially, you know, paying for, for the workloads that you use uh, rather yep. than, you know, paying for like a server sitting in the closet somewhere. Um, exactly. Do you think that there will be a time where there's like a convergence of essentially vector databases into sort of the existing world of like, you know, structured SQL sort of databases or maybe even like the NoSQL world. Like, you know, I think that there's been a shift that's been happening over time over the last, you know, five years or so of bringing like the, the warehouse and the lake closer together with like the lake host architecture or even some of the things that Snowflake is doing now around both like structured, semi-structured and unstructured data. Do you think that yep. we'll see a similar trend in terms of converging around vector databases living within some of these other, you know, cloud providers or data uh, management systems? Mm, I don't think so because the way you build a vector database is very different from the way you would build a traditional database. Um, and sort of, you know, in a traditional database, you have your data and you sort of build your index to sort of make lookups in your data more efficient. In a vector database, your index really is the database, right? So it's not a bottom piece, sort of like you would add maybe HMSW to Postgres or whatever. Mm -hmm. Your index really is the database that you then build everything around that. Yeah. So essentially the, the technology is just like so fundamentally different. It doesn't necessarily yes. make sense to kind of like, you know, shove, shove a vector database into yeah. Mongo or something like that. I mean, it, it's possible. Like, of course, mm -hmm. it will work up to some scale. Mm -hmm. But once you start pushing it or like trying to use it for um, real world use cases, like, of course, you end up in the same scenario, where, like you need to provide uh, high availability, you need to scale. And uh, yeah, just bolting on an in-memory index uh, into an existing database won't really scale past, past few million items. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we even see that, I think, in the like conventional database world for specialized problems. Like there's, you know, there's there's essentially specialized uh, databases like Rockset for analytics and, you know, ClickHouse yeah. and things like that, where if you're so, dealing with particular types of data or particular types of problems or particular, you know, scale, you're not just going to throw, yeah. uh, you know, a MySQL database at every single problem or something like that. Yeah, another example I would give here is time series databases. Like, of yeah. course, you can do time series in Postgres and in MySQL, but purpose-built uh, database for time series is gonna work much better. Mm -hmm. And then, as we start to wrap up, you know, is there anything else you'd like to share? And uh, also, how can people, you know, get in contact with you if they they have questions or follow-ups? Sure. So, like, if if anything that we talked about seems interesting to to any of the listeners, like we are hiring like, uh, very good people for for the platform team and the and the data team. Uh, so, yeah, reach out to me or or Bank on Curry's page uh, would be a good place. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Awesome. Well, Merrick, thanks so much for coming on the show. I I thought this was yeah. a really interesting conversation, and I, I'm sure uh, the listeners will learn a lot. Yep. Likewise. Right. Cheers.